This is a production of Cornell University. In a November 2014 lecture at Mann Library, Margaret McFall Nye reflects on new research that has dramatically changed our understanding of the ways in which microbes are crucial to the well-being of plants and animals, and explores the new ways that both scientists and artists are finding to express the beauty of this symbiotic relationship. Dr. McFall Nye is a professor of medical microbiology and immunology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and affiliate professor at the University of Hawaii. One of the foremost life scientists in the fields of immunology, symbiosis, and marine biology, she is also serving as Andrew Dixon White Professor at Large at Cornell University through 2017. So um, this is really a great pleasure for me to come and have an opportunity to do this art show that Angela uh, Douglas and I sort of cooked up uh, as part of my A.D. White uh, professor at large position. And it's particularly uh, exciting for me because as I've told a few of you, um, most of the other members of my family are all artists. They're very angsty people. <laughs> and um, I, I got all the athletic genes and all the science genes. <laughs> and I can't do any art. And so this, this is such a special thing for me to be able to, to bring how I see uh, biology, and, and I find biology incredibly beautiful and, and art um, very deeply embedded in it. And so um, I have been studying for the last, oh, uh, I can't, 30 years or so, uh, symbiotic associations between uh, bacteria and animals. And it's really interesting for those of us who study symbiosis because in the last few years, it's people have become aware that symbiosis is a very central theme in biology. And that's because we're now beginning to realize that microorganisms keep humans healthy and, and most other animals healthy. And that was a technology-enabled set of findings. But the field kind of grew up around us. And so we're embedded in this really exciting and new field. And what it actually is demanding is the integration of microbiology into the rest of biology and symbiosis being sort of a central theme. And so um, this art of unseen partnerships, the beauty of small things, um, what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to give just a short lecture so that we can go up and have a reception and see that art. I don't want to <laughs> bother you and bore you for too long. Um, but um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start out and think and, and talk to you a little bit about microbiology and microbes as art before and after the microscope was invented and, and, and the sequencing revolution, what's happened um, since then. And then just spend a few minutes talking about microbiology in art and symbiosis in art and then give you just a short preview to the show. So let's get started. So before the microscope, um, biologists uh, seem to or, or would classify the world uh, as this. This is Aristotle and, and his group as as animals and plants. And so there was there were these two groups, and you just couldn't see anything else. And so uh, you know this was the way people thought about the world for a very very long time. And that's not to say that we didn't know about microorganisms, but we just didn't know that, that, that some of these things were due to microorganisms. So what I'm showing here is I'm showing uh, the sweep of plague across Europe in the 14th century, um, entering down here in Italy in 1347 and sweeping up um, into Scandinavia uh, in just a few years. And, um, at that time, people didn't know that this was a pathogen that was doing this. They thought it was, you know, sinners. If you were a sinner, you would get this. And, or there was something in the air. I mean, there was just, it was just, there was a lot of lore around it, and people didn't really understand what was going on here. But that's not to say that because it was such a profound thing that it didn't find its way into art. And so there was a lot of really amazing art. There was a a saint called Saint Roche 
and St. Roche. There are pictures and pictures and pictures of St. Roche. But this is uh, the a picture from, from 1562, um, not long after the Black Death had swept through. And just some of the most amazing paintings um, of the time uh, were done without them knowing that this was actually the result of a microorganism. Um, then what happened was not too long after early microscopes were invented. And so um, Anton van Leeuwenhoek uh, was, is thought to be the, or is called the father of microbiology. And he used this instrument, this tiny instrument. It's actually a little small. If you ever, I don't know if there are museums around here that have replicas of this, but if you ever go to the Huntington Library, um, and, in Pasadena, they have a whole section devoted to the Leeuwenhoek's microscope. Um, but uh, Anton van Leeuwenhoek lived from 13, uh, 1632 to 1723, and he was the first person to describe microbes that live in association with the human body. And what he did was he took a cheek swab, um, and he put that cheek swab in his microscope and he, he saw that there were a lot of things in here, and he thought they were little animals. And so he called them animicules, just they were tiny, tiny animals. He didn't think of them as microorganisms or uh, the like. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing was he, he did not connect these with disease at all. Okay, so the connection between disease and microorganisms had not been made. Um, and another interesting factoid in getting ready for this lecture I ran into was that he lived down the street from Vermeer. And so he lived in Delft a few meters from Johannes Vermeer. And um, actually they must have known each other quite well because on September 30th, 1676, um, after Vermeer's death, the town council designated him as the executor to the will and he took care of Vermeer's widow, Catherine Bolas. And so um, I thought it was just amazing that, that these two luminaries, one, um, and, and oftentimes these, at this time, these people were sort of Renaissance people. They did a lot of different things. Uh, but this, this here is, a, is a, the symbiosis of the mouth, a drawing about 100 years later, a rendering of what Anton van Leeuwenhoek had, had, um, had found uh, in his mouth which is, is pretty amazing, but absolutely beautiful, beautiful drawings. A little, um, um, the connection between uh, microbes and disease happened in the mid 19th century uh, with Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, um, who were founders of the, the, um, the area of pathogenic microbiology. And so what they did was they, it was, they, it was the germ theory, and they found that, that germs, I mean, the idea was that it wasn't um, that you had sinned or something like that. It was that you had a microbial problem, some kind of microbial disease that was giving you these problems. And they relied on being able to culture the microorganisms. And so um, Koch's postulates holds that you have to be able to culture the microorganism, uh, that you suspect is, is, is conferring this disease, and then after you've cultured it, give it to something, that, uh, another animal that doesn't have the disease and, and have that animal get the disease, and that's sort of Koch's postulates, to show that that microorganism is responsible for that disease. But this is to say that these, these guys were really critical. And when you go to the American Society of Microbiology meetings, to this day, there's this huge group of people that, that study pathogenic microbiology. But it turns out that um, one of the reasons why we didn't know about all the microbes in and on us is that only about 0.1% or less than 0.1% of the microbes that are out there are culturable. And so it really took um, other methods uh, to, to let us know about those guys. Well, fast forward, you know, during the, about the same time that the pathogenic microbiologists were working, um, there was another uh, luminary, Ernest Haeckel, um, who himself was a true Renaissance person. He was an artist. He was um, a statesman. He, he had some very, very, very controversial ideas that were actually used by the Nazis uh, sometime later. But, 
Um, he had this um, uh, Art Forms in Nature that he published in 1904. And this is an absolutely beautiful uh, set of drawings that he made. And in, these, in each of one of these radiolaria, which are um, microorganisms themselves, um, with algal symbionts inside. So inside you can see the <laughs> symbioses that, uh, of these organisms. And this came from the Challenger expedition of 1873 to 1876. And this particular expedition was amazing because it had gone down and um, sampled the deep sea. And they had new trawls, new ways of trawling the deep sea, and they were able to go into places that had formerly been considered azoic, in other words, not to have any life forms. And they, were, they described 4,000 new species from this. And it's interesting to muse that with, with being able to sequence the microorganisms of our gut and know who they are, we, there are places in our body that have, in not 10 years ago, and even this past year, um, that were thought to be azoic, that we now know um, have um, associations with them. So for instance, just this year, they found out that the placenta has a microbiome associated with it. And so we, areas of the body that we had formerly <laughs> considered azoic were now, just like the Challenger had, had, had found that the deep sea was not azoic, um, once you get better methods and methods that allow you to approach something, um, you find new things. So the, the, one of the, the things about not being able to culture the microorganisms, you, two questions arose that v Anton van Leeuwenhoek couldn't, couldn't know. He couldn't approach what are these things. I mean, he called them animicules, and he could draw them, and he could look at them, and, and so on and so forth. But he couldn't know who they were and what relationships they had to other organisms. And what in the world are they doing in there? Well, that had to fast forward, we're talking fast forward hundreds of years, uh, into just the most recent time in biology. And so for those of you who are not biologists in the audience, biology is actually in a revolution because of the discovery of uh, you know, high throughput sequencing and our ability to know and understand the relationships among microbes and animals and plants. Microbiology did not have evolutionary biology at all until this time point. The microbes, sorry microbiologists in the group, they're, they're not as, their morphology is not as, um, they're more featureless. And so we couldn't, we couldn't assign them to various uh, groups very effectively. And what they, we relied on was something called Berge's Manual which was a way to physiologically um, pigeonhole them or bin them uh, into, <clears throat> into groups that we might be able to understand based on their behavior in physiology. That turns out to not have anything to do with their relationships. And we could only do that by looking at their DNA. And this, this has only happened in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. And this is happening big time. Um, these, I just wanted to give you an idea of how much biology is enabled by this. So what I'm showing you is I'm showing you the cost of sequencing DNA, megabase of DNA. Now I should tell you that a microorganism is on average a couple of megabases of DNA. And so um, in 2001, it would cost you about $12,000 to sequence a microorganism. And Moore's law is the law that describes the doubling of computer power every two years. And so you see this. And, and there's the idea that the cost um, as, as the computer power, and it, that, that things will follow, like the cost of sequencing ought to follow Moore's law. It ought to become cheaper and cheaper. Well, what happened in, in 2006 was there was a big sea change in the way sequencing was done. And we got next generation sequencers, we call them next gen sequencing happen, entered the market in 2006. And the cost went from $6,000 in 2001 to about 600 in 2006, down to 10 cents <laughs> a megabase. How enabling that is to the, to the community of biologists. 
And now we know that you have 10 to the 14th bacteria on you and it's completely doable. People are you getting their fingerprints, they're getting their microbiome fingerprint. I mean, there is so much potential um, here for what, uh, what we could know and uh, about the relationship of microorganisms to animals and plants. Um, not just in, in symbiosis, but people like Craig Venter, see Craig Venter going out to sea, and, and um, I think it's a bit of a boondoggle, but he's going out to sea and collecting uh, and, and describing the richness of the microbes. It's interesting to think about the fact that, that applying molecular methods to plants and animals did not really change our view of, pla of, of, of plants and animals a whole lot at the higher taxonomic levels. So we, we started off before this big sequencing with 20, uh, excuse me, 30 to 40 phyla of, back, of uh, animals. We now have 30 to 40 phyla of, of animals, depending upon whether you're a lumper or a splitter. Um, this has changed. Back here, um, actually back in 1970, it was thought that there were four phyla, or four major groups of bacteria. And by 1980, uh, excuse me, uh, let's see, 2005, it was thought that there were around 80. And then we got next gen sequencing, and there was just an article that came out two months ago to show that there are around 1,000 phyla of bacteria very conservatively. And so, um, as I was telling some of you guys, um, I, I called up a friend of mine over in Hawaii, Ed DeLong, and I said, Ed, that's impossible. I don't believe that. And he said, he said to me, Margaret, you're crazy. He said, he said, you know, we didn't know who they were, and they're in all the habitats. And he said, what's more, they've been around for 3.7 billion years. I mean, come on. Of course there are going to be that many. And he said, these guys are really rigorous scientists who did this. So it's really remarkable. And this is causing a huge change in the way we think about biology. So let's think about microbes and art. Done with the biology lesson. <laughs> let's turn to microbes as art. I, when I was putting together this, this I, I found this, and I thought this was really cool. Um, because because um, here at Cornell, uh, we have, uh, there, is, there is a, a collection of animals in, as, in glass that, uh, where are they, Drew? Uh, we have them here in Maine, uh -huh. in Corson Hall and the Johnson, to watch their collection. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, I ran across this guy, Luke Jerram, and Luke uh, does microorganisms in glass. And so you can see all of these um, different microorganisms. He actually has one of Ebola that's quite frightening. <laughs> I didn't put that here. But just to give you an idea, this is the swine flu virus. I just think it's absolutely exquisite. The other thing that I thought was really cool about this is he sells these pieces. And he sells them at a very reasonable price, a few hundred dollars, which I thought, you know, if I knew if somebody worked on swine flu, I'd get together with a bunch of people. And, and I mean, it's just beautiful, I think. And uh, this is another virus uh, that he had. And this is salmonella. This is what <laughs> gives you food poisoning. And isn't this beautiful, this clear glass? And these are the flagella coming out um, of the side of this organism. Now, lest you think that these pieces are, are small, that's the artist. That's the artist next to E. coli. Isn't that amazing? So this is his rendition of E. coli. I just thought that was so amazingly beautiful. So um, there are places where microorganisms have been in art, but that's not these. Many of these are in symbiosis, like. Uh, but this isn't showing the symbiosis. Lots of the ways in which we've been able to see symbiosis are through photographs, and so I'm showing you a couple of of organisms that. Uh, photographers have focused in on, um, you know, artists, people who are, are photographers. And this is Cassiopeia, the upside down jellyfish, and it's brown because it has a symbiotic association with zooxanthellae, um, algae, that help it uh, photosynthesize. It lives almost like a plant. And then down here, the soft coral um, is brown for the same reason. 
And this soft coral is preyed upon by this exquisitely beautiful nudibranch. And this nudibranch takes the, the little algae out of the cells of this soft coral and st it steals them and puts them in diverticula of its gut up here. And this is a solar powered sea slug. And isn't it exquisite? And so um, I just thought, you know, when I was going through and looking at the photography, I just thought this was very cool. Now, for everybody who's not a biologist in the room, you can just close your eyes for a minute. This here, <laughs> this here is art to a biologist, okay? And I'm showing this very cool paper in which they've taken um, algae introduced into human cell lines that become stable and allow the, the human and, and increase the longevity of human cells. And this just came out this month. This is an amazing thing. There are only certain algae that will do this and there are only certain cell lines that will take them up and maintain these algae. But how cool is that? Anyway, that's for the biologists. <laughs> so there, has, there have been other places where, I mean, this is just, to represent the wasp microbiome. This artist has all of these colorful things on the outside of this wasp um, are, are microbes associated uh, with the wasp. Um, I think the white wasp microbiome, in my opinion, is likely not, be, not as diverse as the human microbiome, but it's got a lot of microbes in its gut. And this is another um, rendition of that sort of thing, another a, a way another artist uh, took a look at this. And now I want to show you what artists have done with the human microbiome. And so this has been a really fertile ground for the, for the um, art community. And so this, um, I couldn't hope to pronounce that name correctly, um, but this person, this is the self-portrait of the human microbiome. And so this is how this person portrayed the human microbiome. So as most of you know, we are 10 to the 13th animal cells and 10 to the 14th microbial cells. So if you look at the person next to you, no matter what you think of them, they're 90% non-human, <laughs> okay? And so um, this, this, I just thought was a really beautiful uh, rendition of the human microbiome. I found this particular one um, was also uh, very evocative of microorganisms. And um, it uh, came out of the, the, the uh, Chinese efforts um, to sequence the human microbiome. And actually, I, I contacted one of my former students to tell me what that was saying. And it's saying the human body is dominated by bacteria. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we start here thinking that we're sterile or something. Actually, I have to say that one of the most famous microbiologists wrote a review in 1979. And in that review, he said, wouldn't it be great if we were sterile? Now, this guy's a pathogen, very, very famous pathogenic microbiologist. And what he was thinking about was we would be free of disease, bacterial or, or, or microbial disease, if we could be sterile. Well, it turns out that we are so far from that. Um, and, and, and that's our healthy state far from that. So this um, as opposed to, to this. And um, this came from, as you see, this, this website here. And uh, Walt Whitman, I ran across this quote, I am large, I contain multitudes. <laughs> and so Walt Whitman, of course, had no idea that what he was talking about. <laughs> In other words, that, that, that this would be um, something that would, would be more than true in more than one way. And so this, I thought this was really beautiful. And now this is a rendition of, we now know that there's very strong connection between the microbiota of your gut and your brain. There, the gut, they call it the gut-brain axis. And there's a lot of evidence now that, that, my, that the microbes of your gut influence behavior and, and can cause all kinds of behavioral problems if they're not in the right balance. And so this is, I thought this was a really cool uh, rendition of that idea. I thought this was cool too. 
And so what has happened is various departments across the country who are focusing on microbiomes and various institutes and whatnot are putting their artists at that wherever they are to say, you know, give us something, give us a, a very cool rendition of what you think uh, this, and this, this is Peter Waring, 2013. <clears throat> and I thought this is, if you looked at this, this is an embroidery of microbes colonizing our bodies. And this woman, Rebecca Harris, if you, if you hone in on this image, each one of these is, it's an embroidered um, piece. It's just exquisite uh, on this hand. I thought that was really great. <clears throat> now, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we can put this, this presentation on the web for anybody who'd like to see it. This, I put the, the, um, the link here to this, this uh, video. It's a five minute video that's just, it's a cartoon and it, it's art from start to finish. And it's really a very cool thing. This is one portion of it with, these are bacteria in your gut. Um, changing your food and giving you what they want to give you. <laughs> stoking, stoking the fire. Um, but it's, it's a really great, great video. And I'm hoping that we can put it so, up somewhere so that if you guys are interested in looking at it, you can. This is also <coughs> a YouTube video. And I love this image. So this is a person, obviously, and their microbiome in green and yellow, leaning down onto this piece of paper, dr doing a drawing. What this study was about was they, it's artistically done like this, and what they did was they showed the person being here, and then this family, I think it's a, it's a couple, moving out of one place and moving into another, and what they did was they showed the change in the microbiome of the built environment uh, as, the pe as the people moved from one spot to another. And they did that uh, by showing the movement of the, the microbes uh, in green and yellow. It's, it's really, really very cool, fantastic. So I wanted to finish up by telling you, giving you a primer for what you're going to see upstairs. Um, the kind of, some of you aren't biologists, and I wanted to let you know how some of these images were captured. So a lot, some of the stuff upstairs, some of the images upstairs, um, stuff, um, is confocal microscopy. And so what a biologist is doing when they do confocal microscopy is you put the, put the specimen on a stage and you shine a laser through that image and you do that at a series of planes. And so you can do a stack and, and have a three-dimensional rendering. So what you do is you scan across here and you get uh, this, this two-dimensional image, and then you lower it down and you scan again a little bit deeper in the tissue, and then you scan again a little bit deeper in the tissue. And then you ask the computer to reconstruct the image. And so what happens is you get a three-dimensional image. And so this is actually a three-dimensional image from my own lab of a confocal micrograph. And so this is a portion of the animal that captures the bacterial symbiont. But isn't that amazing? I just, I think, you know, I drive my students crazy because I love to sit with them on the confocal <laughs> microscope and bother them because I find the images so incredibly beautiful. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing here, each one of these little dots is a cell. And so it's been stained with fluorescent molecules, and that, that laser beam that is going through there um, excites molecules, and those molecules that are in the tissue um, emit, and you're able to catch that emission and see the image itself. <clears throat> so another thing that you're going to see is you're going to see a, a, a really very exciting kind of um, electron cryomicroscopy. And this is the big microscope that does this. And this particular microscope, what you do is you freeze your sample, and, you, and that allows you to have very few artifacts. I mean, you get pretty much what's in there. Um, and what this is showing, this is a little larva of a marine invertebrate. 
And this, this is Hydroides elegans. And Hydroides elegans settles on bacterial biofilms. It responds to bacterial biofilms to settle. And so here's an adult Hydroides. And they're little white tubes. The next time you're at a dock, a marine dock, or the next time you're around ships, look down at the hull of that ship. And in fact, the fouling of Hydroides elegans of the sides of ships costs the Navy millions of dollars a year, billions of dollars a year, on drag um, created by the fouling of Hydroides elegans. <coughs> so this little back, so for, I'm not kidding you, for dozens of years, biologists thought of everything else but microbes that might be inducing this. And very, you know, very, very recently, this paper came out this year. And so very, very recently, they found that, that what the larvae require is they require a biofilm that has been created by bacteria on the surface where the, where the larvae are going to settle. So they make this little biofilm. And the larvae say, ah, oh, this must be a great place to settle. And this, this thing right here is, is a feature on the inside of the bacterium that causes the settlement. And actually, this is a derivative of a virus that was inside the bacterium that is um, causing, creating the biofilm. And so this, this rendering that you see here, this beautiful sort of artistic uh, piece here, is the result of <coughs> analysis by uh, electron cryomicroscopy. So it's, it's, it's really fun. We have these tools that allow us to do things um, we couldn't do before. Um, you'll also see um, uh, uh, Victoria Orphan's work with, uh, at Caltech with something called NanoSIMS. And what NanoSIMS stands for is Nano Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry. And what um, NanoSIMS does is you take a sample and you say, you know what, I want to find out where where, say, a vitamin is going into the tissues of this animal. Where does that vitamin go? So before you give the animal the vitamin, you label it all up. You make it, you make it, you label it up with what is called heavy isotopes, okay? You label it with something that you can distinguish. Uh, you know, you label the atoms. Then what you do is you fix the tissue and you slice it up, and then you bombard those slices with, um, with oxygen or cesium, and just the very, very top patina comes off that's blasted into something called a mass spectrometer that, that can measure the weight of each of, of the molecules coming off. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to see where the molecule that is enriched in heavy isotopes has gone in that tissue, because most of the tissue is not um, is, is not enriched in heavy isotopes. So it allows you to trace things. And Victoria Orphan is a, is a specialist in that. And this is, this is the NanoSIMS machine, few, a few million dollars worth of instrumentation. OK, so there you go. Any questions or any, any comments? I'm happy to, to take them. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.